Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs. Hello, Avaya family. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner Ike Allen and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a thousand books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you so much for joining us. Our fellow teacher Hillary Jacobs Hendel is back with us today to talk about the role emotions play in healing from trauma. An award-winning author and the developer of the Change Triangle Tool for Emotional Health, Hillary takes the complex world of emotions and and makes them easy to understand and work with for a greater peace, calm, and confidence in our lives. Hillary is a certified psychoanalyst and an AEDP psychotherapist. She has published articles in the New York Times, Time Magazine, Oprah, Salon, and professional journals. She has also consulted on the psychological development of characters on AMC's Mad Men, and her blog on emotions, relationships, and trauma is read worldwide. Welcome back to Avaya, Hillary. Thank you, Andy. I'm so delighted you want to keep having me back. That's awesome. <laughs> well, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yes. Well, it was all you. It's all your accomplishments. Yes. So there you go. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming back. We, we love having you. So let's talk trauma. Like what, what does trauma mean to you? That's a good question. So one of the things that I've tried to do in my work and my writing is to expand the definition of trauma for the public. As a trauma-trained therapist, um, it, it's, it was always clear from training that two things, that trauma from a public perspective is this sort of the idea of a catastrophic event that sort of everybody could witness and see and agree is a catastrophic event, whether one is the victim of a crime or violence or a war veteran. Uh, it's, it's something not mysterious in, in that it's event. And what is also trauma, and that doesn't get a lot of airplay, I started thinking of it or talking about it as the invisible traumas that we, that many of us, I almost want to say that we all have been through in surviving our childhoods of repeated instances of, of emotional neglect, of emotional abuse, of being rejected for aspects of our core self, whether it's based on our race or gender or simply the things that we love and are talented at in relationship to the people in our, our lives that may struggle with those aspects of ourselves or need us to be something that we are not. Uh, you know, for example, uh, to use a very common example, a child raised in a, a family of athletes that is an artist, let's say, and that over the over time, these these bids to be seen as as the artist that the child feels like, whatever that means to people out there, is humiliated, rejected. Uh, criticized so much that the, that this child now grows into a person who feels that certain core aspects of themselves are not fit. There's no room for them in relationships and, and the toll that that does. So trauma, the definition that I would use is any moment or series of moments where there's overwhelming emotions coming up in the face of utter aloneness, no support, and therefore those emotions have to be coped with by the child, teenager, young adult, adult on their own without resources. And therefore the mind, thank goodness, has these 
brilliant kind of fail-safe ways of coping, like dissociation or becoming a rigid character that is very perfectionistic or thinks in terms of black and white. All these symptoms uh, help us get through, but then they begin to cost us. And that's where trauma healing comes in to, re to reintegrate those uh, parts of us that were unsupported and alone and often riddled with shame, a feeling that, that they're that there's no place for them, lest the rejection happen again. Mm. Mm. So that's the way, yeah, that's probably the way I'll talk about it more than the kind of catastrophic trauma, although mm. we, we can go with either one. Yeah, that's a beautiful um, exploration of trauma. I love that. That was, yeah, just in thinking about all those different moments, moments. And I love that you brought in like when we don't have support, right? When there's no support for us, then right. How overwhelming that can be. So given talking about some of these like symptoms, do you, do you believe in your line of work it is possible to heal trauma or, or just manage symptoms? I absolutely, I come from a, a healing orientation. In fact, that's why I switched from a psychoanalytic theoretical approach. When I discovered a uh, AEDP, which stands for Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy. This is the work of the brilliant Diana Fosha, who took cur current neuroscience and trauma theory and emotion theory uh, and theories of healing and transformation and put it into a model that, act that totally works. And I think this is the way of the future. But when you understand the brain, so for example, I'll just try to use a prop which I really love. If this is this is a, a lemon squeezer, I, I thought that was purpose, yeah. <laughs> it's it stands for the authentic self, the brain and the body of a person who's just born. Like our we are born with a core sense of self. That's genetics and disposition, and we're all unique. And then from the moment we're born, we start to have experiences, and and these. Pipe cleaners refer to the, the, the neural networks, the, the brain cells that begin to wire when you're little and you see an experience like the expression on your mother's face um, that's connected to you. Let's say you're a little kid and you finally pee in the toilet for the first time and you see your mother light up and you learn like a, it's basically training that that you're good and then you do it again the brain learns. So perhaps that wasn't the greatest example, but what happens in, in trauma is that there's an event that is bad, right? It hurts. It's, it's overwhelming. And it's, it's, it wires with the memory of that event. So let's say every time I show exuberance and passion, my, my family or my teachers say, what are you so excited about? You know, they're grumpy or they're traumatized themselves or depressed. And then I have this network now that says it's not okay for me to show my exuberance. And over time, because maybe I'm naturally exuberant, I get more and more depressed because I'm having to exert energy to hold down my exuberance. The way that it gets healed is by we, this neural network, which is a child from a started long ago through noticing, right? That's why mindfulness is so effective. We are noticing aspects of ourselves and bridging connections so that ultimately these tightly wound traumatic experience networks become integrated again and the triggers go down and we have this nice diffuse, um, it's literally like you, you're building complexity in the brain so that yes, these, these experiences will leave an echo of, you know, I have to think twice before I show exuberance because I have this bad experience, but, um, but I can do it now because I'm aware that this happened to me in the past and it's not everybody that I'm looking through attributing it to that this is what's going to happen again. 
and it can be the same thing in a catastrophic in a in a in a something terrible happens let's say one is physically abused you're going to have all these tightly wound neural networks that are saying people are dangerous and if we do this this and this it's going to be dangerous and through a mindfulness stance, getting to know this child part, getting to know the experience and allowing the core emotions that were originally thwarted to now come forth. That's in a way the, the, the catalytic power of, of emotions. That's why I keep writing about emotions and wanting to teach people about emotions because when we can liberate stuck emotions, it's a very rapid way to rewire the brain and to give the sense to a person who is traumatized that that happened a long time ago and it is over and now I'm safe. And now I can approach the present with at least a partially fresh exposure and, mm -hmm. and fresh take on what's happening now. Mm -hmm. Does that make any it sense? Does. It's you know. It does. Thank you. That is beautiful. Yeah. I love how you, I love your passion about emotions. Obviously that's a, a big part of what you do. And I love how you, yeah, intertwined that. Um, and also the physical representation with the, with the model there. No, that was great. So, so let's talk emotional health. I know that, you know, you've talked about this in, in past masterclasses, the change triangle tool. So what, what is the change triangle tr tool for emotional health and how can we wrap that into this conversation of trauma? Yeah. So let's say um, many times people don't realize that they have been traumatized and when they come into therapy, they come in with a symptom and, likely that symptom is depression or chronic social anxiety, something like that. And if we go through the depression, if we understand the depression as on this triangle, and maybe I should just do a quick screen share sure. to illustrate it. Can you see that? I can. Okay. So in a nutshell, as people come in in their defenses, which are the symptoms that they are using to stay away and avoid the things that upset and, and, and upset that hyper arouse or hypo arouse in a way that the, the mind and body doesn't feel good. And it's usually some combination of these inhibitory emotions of anxiety, shame, and guilt, and these core emotions, which are the first ways that are body and mind respond to an event in the external world that uh, has something to do with our ability to survive, right? We, we all have the same core emotions. They're wired in. It's a myth that you can control emotions because you can't, because evolutionarily we have emotions for rapid adaptive movements to survive. So fear, gets triggered in the middle of the brain. And the first thing it does as a core emotion is it sends signals down to my heart, to my lungs, to my GI tract, to my blood vessels to say, you better, you better start running. You need air pumped into your, in your lungs. You need your heart to beat faster so that you can escape this danger. So let's say that we are, uh, we have a violent attack. Let's say a rape or something like that. Something horrible where the natural inclination to escape or to fight for our life is thwarted. There's gonna be a tremendous amount of energy that's mobilized in the body where emotions live that will not be able to come out. And there's gonna be a massive amount of inhibition, which is, a, which is like muscular shutdown or shame or guilt. There's all these emotions and physical experiences that thwart our impulses in favor of survival. But ultimately once that experience is over and we don't have the proper support. So one could think of trauma, not as the event, but as what happens after the event. And either there's people believe us and they support us and we have a place for our, to process our fear and to process our rage in all sorts of creative ways that trauma therapists know about, AEDP therapists, EMDR therapists, somatic experiencing therapists, 
Um, they, we had, there's techniques like fantasy and body mobilization to move these thwarted emotions through. But if that doesn't happen, if these emotions get blocked, they feel awful because it's literally, we have something blocked in our body. The body is the archive of the memory. So we don't, our mind may forget, but our body doesn't. It's holding this stuff down, which naturally wants to come up for healing because we have an innate ability to heal if we remove obstacles. And so people then come in in defenses, which are the best ways that they can protect themselves from having chronic emotional pain. So yes, I may be depressed, which is a shutdown of feeling and energy, but it's in one way, it's doing its job. I don't have to feel this overwhelming, these overwhelming emotional forces in the body. But the way healing happens in theory and in part is that we try to loosen defenses so that we can transform the inhibitory emotions and make it safe to experiences, experience the, the fear that's been, that has to come up and out usually as sensations like trembly sensations. We just have to be a vessel to let that energy move through us and to be with someone that can make it safe so that we can have that experience and have it be good at the end and healing, not re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's a, a great like physical, like representation in the imagery. And, and it, it kind of makes me think, so, so let's say someone, like you mentioned, trauma is what happens after the event. So let's, if we're talking about a specific event, like a, something horrific, like a rape or something like that, mm -hmm. um, or a car accident or something. Mm -hmm. So, so do you see people who get the help they need, right? They're able to go through that process and get the support and are able to really, I guess, let go of that trauma much faster than someone who obviously doesn't get the help and isn't processing all that stuff. And then years later, they're still dealing, dealing with it. Is that kind of what we're talking about? Yes. Okay. We're, we're talking about that. And not only that, what happened before. So I don't want to give the impression that a car accident or a rape isn't, it's a traumatic event. It's this idea of potential of what's going to happen afterwards that will add, either allow me to recover. And that's going to depend on my genetic, my genetics and my, res, my kind of natural innate resilience. And it's also going to depend on the amount of, it's going to depend on all my experiences leading up to that. Mm -hmm. If I have had an experience of being supported with two loving parents and a loving family, and I generally feel that people are there for me and I'm not alone, I'm going to have the, I'm going to be able to process what happened to me in a different way than if I have had trauma from the get-go, uh, I was, let's say, raised by uh, a single mother that was um, working several jobs, left with people that I didn't know, which is anxiety provoking, um, had troubles in school, was bullied. If all these events left me even sort of more fragile, then it, it in a way that there's so much healing that has to be done. And it's not fair because it's not anybody's fault that that has ha happened to them. Right. That was the hand they were dealt. And, and unfortunately, yes, then it leads to like, um, it reminds me of something I think we talked, not necessarily you and me talked about, but in our one, I think our PTSD event that we did about how people are, if they've had like childhood traumas or, or multiple traumas throughout their life, that they can become more susceptible to things like PTSD later uh, after an event happens that they might not be as susceptible to if they hadn't had all of that right history. It's so interesting. Exactly. Exactly. It's so, it's so painful and it's so unfair. Um, but I do feel optimistic. Uh, I just actually, the last, uh, the last article I put on my blog was called the three reasons why I always hold hope for healing. These are three mm -hmm. science-based reasons. And the three reasons are that one, the brain can change from the time we're born till the time we die. And they used to think that that wasn't the case, that by the time you reached early adulthood, that everything was there. And as long, and the idea that the brain can change is all about what healing is about. And the second thing is that emotions are a catalyst for healing. So 
because our society doesn't teach us anything about emotions, very few of us are comfortable with those seven core emotions of anger, sadness, fear, disgust, joy, excitement, and sexual excitement. But as one works to being able to, in any given moment of the day, recognize those in the body, recognize the impulse that every emotion has towards an adaptive movement, and be able to stay with that experience and process it, it's a wave all the way to the end, that is rapid transformation in the brain towards healing. And lastly, good relationships are transformational and healing. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's somebody, a, a good friend, whether it's a partner, whether it's a coach, or whether it's a, a therapist, that when you find a person that can accept you exactly as you are, allow the feelings, allow the shame that we all feel. The problem with trauma is for some reason, the brain is wired in a way where people really blame themselves and they get stuck on, you know, I think it's an attempt that the brain, the mind wants to control. It wants to feel there's a sense of control. So if only I had done this, things would have been different. And if you recognize it as, as a sort of controlling defense, because it's, the reality is we live in a world where we're all incredibly vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And most of us, again, where we evolved this way, where we can put sort of the inevitability of death aside, we can put that at any given moment, something terrible can happen to someone we love. We can, those get relegated to the back and we go on with life. We live life uh, like it's going to go on forever. And, you know, we're in the moment and we're building lives. And, um, but some people who have experienced a lot of trauma, that that's, it's, it's, it's juggling that that fear of threat is, is always there. Mm -hmm. But with the, with the internalized sense that there is someone with us to hold us, to comfort us when we have emotions, it's much easier to deal with whatever happens. So yeah. it's that idea of like, that old saying of better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. We cannot get involved with people and spare ourselves the grief when the people we love die or get sick, but it's much better to live and trust that we can cope with the grief, process it through in time, in our own time, and then go on to have new, new experiences, which is basically what life is. It's just mm -hmm. a series of experiences and that's how you live a life. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought, brought relationships into that. And absolutely, how many of us have had experiences where we've had a loss or a grief or a breakup or a divorce or a death or something, and we're like, I don't want to do this again because it, it hurt right. too much. But but I love your point about that because that is right. Relationships are healing. They absolutely are. And they bring up so, so many things in us that that right we need to work on and just having the the support that someone who's a rock for us to, that is it's priceless. It's I know. I love it. <laughs> Priceless. And someone just to hug us. Um, right. As we were talking about before, I have a, hopefully having a book come out on therapeutic hugs. So the, the value of finding these ways when, when we're upset on how to calm down in a moment and to have a re reliable resources out there so that we don't have to prevent being upset, but we can live life in spite of all that's happened to us and know that we have a way to move through the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love your book about hugs. I, when we first talked about this before we hopped on, I was like, yeah. Oh my God, that is just so amazing. Like what yeah. a, what an amazing topic. And so like, you may have already kind of touched on this Hillary, but like, how does therapy specifically help people heal trauma? Obviously it's being a, you know, you have that support system mm -hmm. for you. Any other kind of major benefits of seeing somebody to help you through your trauma? Oh my gosh. Yes. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, if you've been through a trauma and you've tried to process it and as much as you, one can and adapt and you find yourself stuck, you want to find a, a very skilled therapist that you have a connection with and as in AEDP, uh, pretty much the steps are you first and always are, are co-creating safety. And why I say co-creating and not creating it is because, you know, it would be just dopey if I came in and we were having a therapy session and I said, you're safe. Like, 
just for me, or like, you can trust me. No, that's not the way people work. You have to feel that that's true. And the way that you build an internalized sense of safety and trust is through experience, but also that, that I am suggesting here's something we can do together that will help you feel calmer. And then we try it. And then I ask you, did that help you? Or did, that, did you not like that? And you might say, oh yeah, actually the grounding and breathing that we just did made me feel much calmer. Mm -hmm. But there are some people where I teach grounding and breathing, right? Because I'm we're always teaching skills to calm. Because you know, as we're going to approach traumatic events, we can we can anticipate anxiety is going to rise, and so we want to have um, a strategy for when that happens. And in AEDP, the strategy would be okay. I'm noticing moment to moment, you know, if I see you're wringing your hands, if I see something you shifting, or hopefully you'll be able to say this, I'm not feeling so great right now. I feel my anxiety rise, we stop what we're doing. And we, you and I have gone through many iterations. So we know what helps you calm down and you feel in control. That's, that's paramount for trauma therapy that you are the expert on you. I don't tell you what's good for you. I, I ask you and I make suggestions. So you would be the expert on you, in my opinion. I would be the expert on various ways to process trauma, which is largely a creative process once you have the, the, the solid, the therapist has the solid training and science foundation. Mm -hmm. So once, cre once safety is created, there's many ways. You can start actually with you know, you don't just have someone relive a trauma because that's how you re-traumatize someone. So we may go, let's go to the, let's go to here, right here and now, right here and now, Andy, do you know that you are safe? You might say, yeah, I mean, I'm in your office, you know, everything is safe. And I might say, what in your body tells you that you're safe right now? And so now we're off to the races where I'm going to ask you to start to reflect on your internal body. And you may say, gee, I, I don't know. And I might say, yeah, no one's ever asked you that question, before, <laughs> but it's <laughs> just to validate. But then I might, you know, you might say, well, I actually, I, my heart isn't beating fast. I don't feel a knot in my stomach. I don't feel jittery. Um, I can see you have a smile on your face, Hillary. You seem friendly. You don't seem judgmental. And then that's great. Mm -hmm. And so we would start to establish sort of maybe start with some, some good feelings, some expansive feelings, some confident feelings, making sure you know you're safe in the here and now. Then maybe go right to right after the accident or the trauma. If it's one of those events, if it's childhood trauma, we might go to again a sense that the that it's over. You don't live with your parents anymore. What's that feel like? Or we can go back to the trauma if someone is ready, and we would do that with a perspective of parts, so that I would be working with you as your present day adult self in the present moment. And then I would say, as you imagine what happened, I want you to kind of see it, imagine it like it's six feet away on a grainy black and white television that's very small. And that would be a technique to help you feel the distance between it so that the emotions from the event don't overtake you in the moment. Because once you fly up into that, we, we have like an optimal, it's called the jargon is optimal arousal where the nervous system is sort of in its optimum place where you can connect to me and think and feel at the same time. But with anxiety, we come out of our zone or we go into sort of a free state below our zone. And as soon as that happens, we can't do any work anymore. We have to stop or it's the work shifts from processing to establishing safety in the moment again. Mm -hmm. So your nervous system begins to have some flexibility to go up then to realize that you're being triggered by the images or sounds or emotions or sensations from the event, we calm down and then we go back and it's through back and forth. In, in my book, it's not always depression. I have 
seven detailed stories of what processing trauma looks like from a catastrophic trauma of the death of a parent, parents that happened um, in the first story of Fran and the adult coming in to process that because there was no space for the emotions to um, other catastrophic events that leave all these symptoms like, like a black hole feeling inside and we explore the whole together. But the bottom line is we're trying to create these bridges, right, through the, uh, through the, the brain and body to the trauma so that it's not cordoned off and just acting like a trigger where it lights up these traumatic experiences like a Christmas tree in the brain. We don't want that. We want everything to to just come down in terms of its intensity. And we do that by connecting to the parts that experienced the, the traumas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You have such a, uh, just a really loving, compassionate way of explaining this. I thought that was very, really beautiful as far as like the benefits of establishing the safety, finding someone that you can trust um, as you establish that safety and, and just that kind of process. So that was, that was amazing. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> yeah. And then like the techniques, it was such a good question. There's many, many techniques to process trauma um, from, from talk therapy to body therapy, to transmagnetic stimulation, um, to now they're using um, hallucinogenics in, con yes. in with therapy because it rapidly changes the brain. Mm -hmm. It's talk therapy, just talk is very limited because trauma is lodged in the body. So you need at least experiential therapy that works with the body. And then even then sometimes, especially with childhood trauma that started at birth, like if you're born to a traumatized mother or father or this drug addiction, the, the, the lack of safety from the get-go is very hard to change. And so um, neurofeedback, these ways that kind of get to the lower areas of the brain uh, are good adjuncts. And then mm -hmm. again, you need that attachment relationship pretty much as a, as that safe, right. secure base. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned the hallucinogenics. I can, I just watched a documentary the other night about that on Netflix with like Gwyneth Paltrow and, um, or, or an episode of whatever her show is. And it was, Ooh, so I saw that episode. Yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that is like, I had no idea like the, yeah. how much that is being used in, um, in that way to help people process that old stuff. So that I thought that was really fascinating. So thank you yeah. for mentioning that. Yeah, uh, so welcome. I want to make sure you have a chance to talk about your gift and anything else um, before we wrap up Hillary, since we're running low on time. So what do you have for us? And there's a button below that links over to your site. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> I'd like to think that the gift that I'm offering to the world, I mean, I've become so is really emotion education. So my, my website, my bread and butter is my therapy practice, but the website hillaryjacobshendel.com is just, a, I like to think of it as a, a one-stop free resource site on understanding emotions and trauma and relationships. So you can go to the toolbox section for people listening, and you can download a copy of the Change Triangle, and you can watch, I have a Change Triangle YouTube channel, and um, with anything from presentations that I've done on emotions and trauma to experiential gentle exercises that you can do along with me, like teach I, you know, how to ground and breathe, which is used to drive me nuts when someone would say like a therapist or someone would say, you know, breathe. And I would be like, breathe, you know, uh, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> but breathing is like with everything, I used to be a dentist and the, and I hated it and I left it. But the one thing I got at a dental school is understanding why I had to floss. Once I understood I, why the science behind it, I flossed from then on in. So it's the same thing. Once I learned how to breathe and why breathing is so important, because it literally is massaging the vagus nerve, which tells the brain to calm down. It's something everyone can practice. So I have instructions written and video where you can do it along with me. Uh, so I would just encourage people and the, and the blogs, there's like 70 articles. They never go out of, they're not obsolete. They're all just different. They're on different things that ail different, different people. And 
it's all based around understanding the change triangle. And people carry around, like my patients will write down, you know, they'll start to notice their defenses. We wanna notice, are we in a defensive mode? Are we experiencing anxiety, guilt, and shame? Are we having a core emotion? Or are we in that wonderful state called the open-hearted state of the authentic self? where we feel calm and clear and we can think it's not that we don't have emotions, but they don't overtake us. So that's a lifelong practice. And I would encourage people to learn it. It's a tool that everybody, I would say 15 years and older can, can comprehend and understand. And it should be taught in high school, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another kind of fun thing, maybe for the younger people out there, is I'm involved with another uh, web series called The drive Through Therapist. You watch an episode, they're five minutes, and then I, I wrote the, um, the sort of each patient, how what they need to know in the real world, and it's got tips and uh, recommendations for emotional health. Mm -hmm. And I also started a course, but it's an eight-week course on Emotions Education 101, where with a group of connected, loving, you know, people were just without judgment, we're working the change triangle and getting to know our emotions and then sharing what it's like to talk about emotions because in our emotion phobic dysfunctional society hmm. where you're like supposed to not have any emotions, oh, don't get me started. Um, it's just, an it's it's this is, I hope, an experience that people will build on and, and bring into their lives. Mm, so thank you. just a lot of stuff to, to look around there. And of course, my book, I hope people read, I wrote it to be really easy. It's a beach read that tells you what you need to know about emotions to thrive with a exercises and things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like no jargon. And I just tried to make it like a page turner because yeah. I don't like boring books. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for all that, Hillary. And there's a, a links in resources below everyone that you can click on to find all of that from Hillary. And do you have any last insights, anything else you want to leave people with before we wrap up? Just that the, the process, even when you feel daunted of getting to know yourself is a gift that keeps on giving and just to take pressure off, there's no goal. It's a lifelong process of understanding um, emotions, physical sensations, thoughts, and really giving yourself permission to learn about yourself without judging yourself as navel gazing, like all these harsh things that people say that it's important to have awareness about how we are and to learn about how human beings are so we understand each other and can get along with each other with all our flaws and our virtues. And it's a worthwhile endeavor. Mm, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for doing this again. You're so welcome. Thanks for having me and take good care. Absolutely. And thank you everyone who's watching or listening for showing up for this presentation today, just for being there for yourself, loving yourself through this process. And we will see you all again soon. Take care. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this latest class with Hillary Jacobs Hendel. She talked with us about the role emotions play in healing from trauma. I always love connecting with Hillary. I think she does a really great job, a very loving, compassionate, uh, great job of describing all of these things to us and the relationship between trauma and emotions and the importance of processing our emotions and, and also the importance of, of getting support. And that's something I want to touch on. So she talked a lot about just the importance of if you've had a traumatic experience, you need to get support for yourself so that you can process it. And maybe you're coming to watching this class today, having had a traumatic experience decades ago, but that does, there's, it's, there's no time that's too late to start getting support. So she talked a lot about just the importance of relationships, the importance of finding people you can trust, of starting to work with someone, whether that's a therapist or a support group or um, really close friends, family that you feel like you can trust, whoever it is, just find somebody and uh, probably multiple people that you could trust and build relationships with so that you feel safe, so that you feel like you can talk about your emotion, emotions, so that you feel like you can count on those people and they can be a great foundation for you in your life as you process everything and start healing from this trauma. So I just thought that was always so key to remember because I think so many of us who have had traumatic experiences, whether that was childhood or adulthood, we can often want to push people away because we don't trust them or we are just like, oh, it's just easier to not deal with, right? Um, 
um, people because of I've had all these tough experiences with them. So um, just remembering that there's always someone amazing out there to help support you and, and help you through this process. So just don't lose hope if that is something that you've struggled with. And I also wanted to make a quick mention of a couple other Avaya University master classes Hillary is a part of overcoming anxiety and depression and overcoming depression and loneliness. Since a lot of her work is centered around depression, she was on those two events um, talking about those two things. So if depression is also something that you struggle with as a result of trauma um, or any number of things, life circumstances, um, go check out those other classes as well. I'm sure that you'll really enjoy Hillary um, talking about those. So thank you again so much for being here and we'll see you again soon. Take care, everybody. Avaya has changed my life. Avaya has made me the woman I am today. Avaya is my home. Avaya is personal freedom. Avaya is the reason my life continuously improves. Let everyone in your life know about Avaya. Everyone needs to know about this amazing company. Thank you, Avaya, for appearing in my inbox. What Ike Allen and Andy Anderson have created at Avaya is what the world needs.